morning. He is risen. Happy Easter and welcome to everybody. And if we have any guests this morning, we have a, a book that you can sign up at the front here. Um, I'm not going to read you all the announcements. They are in your bulletin this morning. Um, I just wanted to highlight one, which I think is great. We collected $1,690 for this year's Lenten project. So that was a great job. Are there any uh, other announcements in the congregation? Okay. I'm going to light the Christ candle. You know, it's so much easier to hate than it is to love, whether it be something or someone. Love takes much more work. So as we light the, the peace candle, we pray for a world where people, especially those in positions of power, will take the time and make the effort to act out of love for our hurting world. Responsive call to worship. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The tomb is empty. Life has defeated death. Rising from the grave, Jesus brings life to all the wrong places. Christ lives for death as rule. Rising from the grave, Jesus brings life to all the wrong people. Christ welcomes those who are often overlooked. Christ's resurrection means that we are no longer lost in the wilderness. He provides us with living hope and travels with us to places where death had once prevailed. The world has been turned upside down. Life has defeated death. Hope has overwhelmed despair. Joy has conquered. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. It's a delight to see everybody here. So we're going to try this one more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. It's a delight to welcome everybody today. I was at the reservoir at 6.30 this morning before the sun got up. It was absolutely perfect. It is such a beautiful day. Uh, the air was fresh and not icy cold as it's been in other days and other, other Easter Sundays. And uh, it, it is a perfect day to celebrate the risen Christ. So thank you for being with us this morning. Our hymn, first hymn this morning is number 243, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Let us offer God our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. God of resurrecting power, we are caught up in the joy of Easter, and your love fills us with expectation. Death will never overcome the life, and the powers of chaos will never overcome your loving intentions for the cosmos. Just as Jesus spoke to Mary in the garden that first Easter day, you call each of us by name because you love us. So we praise you for the hope that you have given us, for your powerful love and your promise of new life in Christ. God of tender mercy, we confess that faith doesn't come easy every Easter. When we face loss in our own lives, sorrow can weigh us down. Our challenges can feel like a stone too heavy to roll away. Forgive us, God. Let the hope of new life in Christ assure us that the power of your love that raised Jesus will never let us go. Amen. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Dear friends, Christ has laid down his life for us, and he invites us to love one another as he has loved us. Let us rejoice in this redeeming, resurrecting love. The anthem this morning is, My Song Doth Bless the Lord. joy to welcome to our sanctuary this morning our getting familiar, our almost our own, quartet. So it is a delight to welcome Craig Garnum, Kelly J, Paul J, and Susan Mayo as they bring to us Adoramus Te. Oh, oh. 
Can you hear that sung across Europe, across the world, hundreds of years in ancient cathedrals, praising God? It was lovely. Thank you very much. Now we are going to sing hymn number 247, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Let us pray. Spirit of power and new possibility, open our minds to understanding, our hearts to loving, and our wills to carrying out the mission of the risen Christ, who is God's living word. Amen. For those of you who participated in our Good Friday events, the crosswalk or the worship service, It has been a long weekend, a wee taste of what that first Easter must have been like. The exception to that is that most of us in our denomination do not actively participate in any kind of formal service on Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and it's simply not been part of our tradition, although lots of churches do have Saturday services. And yet, we can all imagine what that day must have been like for those first disciples. Here's a poem written by Carrie Greenhill about yesterday, the day after Good Friday. Listen to it and imagine yourself as one of the disciples. This is the hardest time to pray. After the drama and catastrophe, before the angels and the big reveal. The passion, the agony, the desperate grief have given way way to numbness and absence in this time in between. God seems to be off stage, 
preparing for the final scene, taking care of other ancient souls in other worlds, or clothing the hidden, broken body in resurrection glory. So let our prayer this day be plain and to the point. May God be with us in the waiting, and may we wait with hope today and every time in between. I read this poem today as an introduction to Easter Sunday. We know that there can be no Easter Sunday without Good Friday, but we should also remember that day in between when everything stopped for Jesus' disciples and friends. We also have days in between when we're in limbo, suspended between yesterday and tomorrow. Indeed, God may be with us in the waiting, something we're not always good at. What are you waiting for? The Jews of Jesus' day celebrated Passover on that day in between, so there were prescribed events at home for the whole day. Hence, there was no opportunity and perhaps no desire to go to the cemetery to stand and ponder and remember Jesus. It was just too soon. The shock had not worn off. As well as feeling numb and shell-shocked, Jesus' friends were probably highly afraid. If the Romans and their own religious leaders, enemies of each other, could band together and contrive to kill Jesus, a popular public figure, then surely they were next on the list. Yes, on that Saturday, they were feeling stunned, but they were also fearful that they too might be arrested. They were in hiding. The next day, the first day of the week, some people stirred. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell the story of that Sunday morning, and they tell largely the same story. But the details are different, and that makes sense, given that these stories were written some 40-plus years after the event. Today, we'll read the resurrection story as told in the Gospel of Matthew, and Bernice Field will lead us in that reading. Reading from Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10, the resurrection of Jesus. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers. Go to Galilee. There they will see me. In Matthew's version of that Sunday morning story, it is two of the several Marys among Jesus' friends who got up early, shook off their fear and numbness, and went to the cemetery. They went to see the tomb, as the text said, just as we sometimes go to a cemetery to stand close to a place where someone we love rests forever. And we remember, and remembering brings us comfort. 
At 6.30 this morning, as I mentioned before, I stood with others at the reservoir on Millard and watched the sunrise as we sang those familiar Easter hymns. It is a lovely sight with the pond and the waterfowl and other birds in that area of wetlands. But it suddenly occurred to me that we were in the wrong place. We should have sung our Easter joy in the Stouffville Cemetery, where we could have read out the names on the headstones and on the niches in the columbarium and shouted, Hallelujah! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Hallelujah! And while we would not expect the sudden appearance of an angel or the risen Lord himself, perhaps we would nevertheless be reminded that death and despair and darkness are not all that there is. We refuse to believe that death gets the last word in our lives and that it defines our lives. We do believe in the hope and love and freedom gifted to us by God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We know in our heart of hearts that our loved ones in that cemetery are now experiencing a whole new kind of reality, one in which the God of love is everywhere and where joy and peace prevail. In Matthew's text, Jesus appears and the women grasp his feet. They needed his body to be tangible, touchable, to confirm what their eyes were telling them and what their hearts were hoping against hope might possibly be true. They were feeling both fear and great joy and trying to make sense of it all. The announcement of Jesus' resurrection doesn't take away all their fear. Rather, it enables them to keep faith amid their fears, to do their duty and share their good news in spite of their anxiety. And this, I think, must be the very definition of courage. And courage is exactly what Easter is all about. For the gospel gives us the ability to keep our feet amid the tremors of our lives and enable us not just to persevere, but even to flourish when life becomes difficult. Both the angel and Jesus convey the same message to the women. These are their marching orders for them. Number one, do not be afraid. Number two, come and see. And number three, go and tell. Jesus called the other disciples his brothers, an amazing act of reconciliation with those who had refused to believe and were executed because he was arrested and executed and then would have been resurrected by, from death by God. Betrayals by Judas and Peter, abandonment in his hour of need by the other disciples, all of that is forgotten by Jesus. He has been raised from death. Now there is work to be done and his brothers and sisters, his community of disciples, will accomplish it on his behalf, starting with those women. And he leaves them with words of promise. There in Galilee, they will see me. In Matthew's recounting of that first Easter morning, Jesus offers the women no cosmic explanation for the meaning of his resurrection. He doesn't mention the words salvation or sin or atonement or sacrifice. All we know from this story is that Jesus is alive again and that he plans to spread the good news of his resurrected life with the help of his friends, his disciples, starting not in the big city of Jerusalem, but back home in Galilee among family and friends. And that's where we should start as well, at home in our own community. Their and our message is about life and joy. We walk by faith, not by sight. We don't have all the answers. And as we mature in faith, I think we learn to live with mystery and awe. 
Jesus really was raised from the dead. He really is alive. And he really is still right here in every act of love and kindness and grace and compassion and hope. Jesus lives, and so do we. That's all we need to know. That's all most people need to know. There are some elements of our faith that we may never fully understand. We must live with the mystery. But what we can do is have the experience of the risen Christ in and through our lives. We can sense the presence of the Spirit. We can feel Jesus' impulse to compassion. And we can enjoy the freedom of faith and hope in the God who is always with us. As well, we can be part of making that realization a reality in the lives of others. The reason we celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday is because that same spirit of the risen Christ that the women experienced lives in me and in you and in all who have the awareness of his continuing presence. We believe in a God who is working to bring grace and peace, and mercy, and love, and justice, and freedom, and joy, and life into every life. Christ's resurrection means that the story of Jesus is to be continued in you and in me, and in every life that is touched by the power of the good news that he is risen. On the cross, Jesus cries out the beginning words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As his church, we make our promise with the last verse of that same psalm to proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, to future generations. The resurrection promise is about the deep reality of living a holy life even in the midst of violence, sickness, and death. The resurrection promise is about God's reckless love for us and our ability, by God's grace, to live out that reckless love toward other people. The resurrection promise is a reminder to not hold on to the life we think we want, the way we think we want things to be, but to move forward proclaiming good news, trusting God for the fullness of life that awaits us in this world and the next. Easter means that we have another chance to be the people that God created us to be. We've already begun in that work, and we will continue it together. We too are called to not be afraid, to come and see, as we are doing this morning, and to go out and share good news to all who need it the most. At the time that this gospel was written, probably around the year 70 AD, the Apostle Paul was by then writing letters to the newly formed congregations. Paul's teachings focused on what Jesus' death and resurrection meant for new believers. The epistle text is from his letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. The new life in Christ. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will re be revealed with him in glory. One of the joys of participating in our weekly Friendship Circle Bible study is listening to each other read a biblical text passage from different versions of the Bible. It is fascinating to hear the different nuances provided by different writers. 
Bernice read part of Paul's letter to the Colossians from the newly and recently updated New Revised Standard Version. We read this from this every week, the NRSV. Another version that we often consult in our Bible study is that of Eugene Peterson's The Message, uh, in written in much more relaxed and uh, up-to-date language. And so here's his translation of those four verses. So, if you're serious about living this new resurrection with life, uh, this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. And that's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up, when Christ shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too, the real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity, like Christ. To become formed and conformed and transformed as disciples of Jesus, we place our allegiance, our, our sense of self, in Christ. For you have died, says Paul in the NRSV version, while the message clarifies that your old life is dead. What has died is the central place of our ego in our lives. That central place in our heart or souls is now occupied by the Spirit of God to whom we pray for wisdom and guidance. The Spirit of God lives within us and will accompany us throughout most, both this life and the next. And when, at last, we are able to let go of our mortal struggles and rest in the vibrancy and, and love of God face to face. And let us be alert, aware of today's circumstances. Know our neighbors and who's struggling. That means we become ever more outwardly focused, not inwardly looking. Yes, we invite others into our fellowship all, every day, all the time, for all of our events. But we are also will, having to be willing to let go of self and walk with others in their circumstances, in their part of town, so to speak. The Christian life is about the presence of the risen Christ in the daily lives of all of his followers, then, now, and into the future. In a few minutes, when we begin our communion liturgy, together we will recite the mystery of Easter. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, past tense. That happened only once, more than 2,000 years ago. Christ is risen, present tense, the reality of the risen Christ in our lives today. Christ will come again, future tense, speaking to a time when we will be welcomed by the risen Christ. To seek the things that are above encourages us to look around at our world, local to global, and to view it through, through the eyes of Christ, view it through Jesus' eyes. It means allowing our vision of life, our worldview, to be Christ-centered, not culture-centered. And it echoes an earlier comment by Matthew that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We have been raised with Christ, and we are filled with a sense of both awe and celebration. How eager we are to see where and how the risen Christ will meet us in our family members, neighbors, and friends, in our prayers, in our advocacy for what is good and just, and in our own gratitude for life and resurrection. The story of the resurrection of Jesus reminds us that in this world, God is about the work of grace, love, mercy, 
hope, justice, and new life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. God of power and possibility, you broke open the tomb that held our Lord. Now break into your church where your people are distracted by old quarrels, discouraging results, or unhelpful divisions about mission and service. Resurrect, renew, and revive your church. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of resurrection and new life, you broke into the hearts of Jesus' fearful friends. Now break into our relationships with one another. Where they are vibrant and life-giving, nurture them. Where they are strained by old hurts and misunderstandings, or carelessly taken for granted, mend them. Resurrect, renew, and revive our life together. God of might and mercy, you broke the schemes of those who stood in the way of your love. Now break into the governing systems of your world. Stir the minds and hearts of leaders to work for justice and equitable sharing. Where laws are corrupt, or people suffer under harsh rule, call them to account. Resurrect, renew, and revive the leaders of the world. God of healing and hope, you broke the bonds of death which tried to shackle new life. Now break into situations of illness, pain, grief, and loss. Wherever people are sick, in body, mind, or spirit, wherever someone mourns the loss of any relationship or dream, bring your healing grace. Resurrect, renew, and revive our lives. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of Easter renewal and resurrection, you have broken into our lives again this day. We give you thanks for the power of your love to remake every situation that brings us challenge or choice. Break into all our moments of celebration and joy as well. Give us gratitude, the impulse to share, and a spirit of grace and understanding. Resurrect, renew, and revive your people. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now we pray in one voice the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. On this Resurrection Day, we come to the table to remember our future with our risen Lord. Remember, Jesus declared that people will come from east and west and north and south to sit at the table in God's kingdom. Remember, the risen Lord has spread his, this joyful feast for you. The gifts we bring to his table are for all those who love him and for all who want to love him more. All who belong to the body of Christ are welcome to share his gifts on this joyful Easter day. Taste and see that, the, that God is good. The hymn is number 546, Here is Bread, Here is Wine.
Please be seated. <coughs> it has been our practice to say the Apostles' Creed at this point in the communion service. At our last communion, on the first Sunday in Lent, we recited a creed from the Anglican Church in New Zealand and Polynesia. Today we will say together a creed written by the Iona community in Scotland. It is also based on the Apostles' Creed. It is printed in the bulletin and will also be projected or not. It's in the bulletin. <laughs> Does everybody have a copy of that? Please stand and let us recite it together. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all that lives, of sun, moon, and stars, of water, air, and earth, of male and female, all genders, colors, and cultures. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman's womb, servant of the poor. He was tortured and nailed to a tree. He bore the suffering of others, but died himself forsaken. He descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present and his reign will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of transforming flame, life-giving breath of the church, energy of healing, justice, and forgiveness, source of resurrection and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll now say the great prayer of thanksgiving, number 564 in your hymn book, and the refrain will be printed, projected. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And with you also. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks. Holy One, on this joyful Easter day, we offer you our gratitude and praise with hearts full of love, for we have seen your grace and power rolling away the stone of sorrow and despair, bursting from the tomb in the gift of new life. And so we join our voices with all your creatures, high and low, with all the saints before us, beside us, and yet to come in heaven and on earth, to celebrate your resurrecting power. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Receive our praise and joy this day, O Christ. Your resurrection promises that there are new possibilities for us and our weary world. Even when we falter in discouragement, even if we hesitate at the news that your great love has come back to embrace us, you will not let us go. You call us by name to assure us of your love. You open your arms to welcome us back to your side. You have spread this table for us offering us not only the bread and wine, but your very self, present with us here and everywhere. In anticipation of receiving these gifts, we proclaim the mystery of our faith and our hope as we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Spirit of life, rising in us and around us, Breathe upon us now and upon this bread and wine that they may be for us Christ's body and blood, gifts of new life, 
with the power to make us whole. As this bread and wine become a part of us, may we become a part of you, Lord Jesus, united with you and with each other in love. Dare us to live for justice and joy, trusting that all things will work together for good through the power of love that raised you from the dead and the power of the love we share in your name. Amen. Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Each time you drink from it, you do it in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. This is the bread of heaven. This cup represents the new covenant with Christ. Drink from it, each of you. This is the cup of salvation. invites us to join him at this table, to eat and drink with him, and to come to him always. As well, Jesus invites us to go out, out into the world, to act with grace, to work for justice, to celebrate God's love with compassion, to share hope with our community, and to welcome the world with open arms. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world and into our future in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our concluding hymn is number 255, Now Let the Vault of Heaven Resound.
with the wonder at the empty tomb to amaze you, with the joy that Mary felt in the garden to lift your hearts, and with the disciples' hope at the news that Jesus had risen to encourage you. And may God's resurrecting love open the future for you, empowered by the Spirit and embraced by Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Let us walk with the Lord this day and every day, together.
feel free to take them. Mm -hmm. 